spoken lately. I haven't thought about flying for a long time. I have a dream that at the moment when I was alone above the clouds for a long time. I have dreamed waking up in a room surrounded in blue and green grass more years than I could dream of memory. I haven't walked back into the past or scratched on the doors of my origins where it all came from since I held up that cape for the last time. Return to Kent Town 10th year anniversary edition is a revised version of Andy N's first poetry book. The book can be purchased from Amazon and it contains numerous additional material. Spoken Label. Hi, it's Andy Ann from Spoken Label. A spoken Label was originally set up at the beginning of 2016 and records show it started off really as a one-off podcast chatting to writers, poets and artists. Over time, it became monthly, then weekly. And occasionally, nowadays, it goes on that to a more regular basis. To date, I've done over 330 sessions and I'm always looking for new poets, writers, artists, singer-songwriters, general interesting creative people to come onto the podcast. You can find this on all the usual networks over Apple, iTunes, Spotify, Podbean, Podbay and dozens of others. But it does have a central database of spoken label, which is all one word, dot bandcamp.com. Obviously now, to help me with the running costs of this podcast, I'm always grateful for any kind of donation to assist me with it. You can even do the donation through the Bandcamp page by putting in a fee to download one of the free podcasts, or send it over to my PayPal to aen1mpo at yahoo.co.uk My email address again is aen1mpo at yahoo.co.uk Enjoy the podcast. Take care. Bye. Spoken Label. Hey guys, Andy and Spoken Label back in the house on a bloody cold Friday evening. It's that cold at the minute, so I've got a dressing gown on, I've got a jumper on, and I've got two t-shirts, and a hat and scarf as well in my little living room. Not on Zoom tonight, because we've got a friend of us, a dear, dear friend. And I was just chatting to my dear friend, who I'll introduce in a minute, and I think I've known this gentleman for about nine years now. I'm horrified, I've never got my spoken label before. So, to my friend here, K. Scott Fuchs, and I hope I pronounced your surname right, K as well. I have a deep apology for this one, my friend, because we should have had you on a long time ago. So, this gentleman is a, he's a fantastic all-round first-time bloke. So, Kay, obviously, first of all, buddy, tell us a little bit about yourself, then, and where did your creativity come from? And where, and where uh, Tell us a bit about your background, then. Hello, everyone. Um, indeed, we've been friends for a long time, and uh, it's been a, it's a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm big into Victorian literature. I've always been big into it, so that that's what influenced me. I'm uh, not from the area originally, obviously, as one can tell, but... Uh, I, we, we, we won't hold it against you, right? Well, don't hold it against <laughs> me. But, uh, you know, Manchester's uh, we're, that's home now. Thank the Lord. And, um, yeah, I mean... Uh, in terms of poetry, it's always been Emily Dickinson, who's like a great influence on me. But when it comes to writing novels and all that, um, Anne Bronte uh, and, uh, you know, the I mean, there's so many different things that influence me as a writer. I mean, uh, it's hard to even, it's, it's hard to put, it's hard to pin it down to one because you could just uh, hear, you know, there's, there's a lot of great you know poets that you run into and and they could just create a, a spark for you like someone like yourself or others that i've encountered so um but if i was to just say where the creative if there was a creative influence it would be emily dickinson and Anne bronte 
Yeah. When did you first start writing then? Because I said, well, there's nothing to hide it. I've known you. We've been known each other, what, nine years now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nine years, and I know you, when I first met you, you were a rapper. I knew you to rapping originally. Still do. Yeah, you still do, and I've seen you do some devastating rapping before now. Not really big into that, never, but it just, yeah, I mean, it's, it's something, it helps me with the poetry, the poetry, it's just a way to get poetry going. Yeah, you know what I mean? It's a way to express the poetry, but it's always been about writing poetry, um, and writing in general. Writing in general is just, you know, um, but uh, I've been writing poems and writing other stuff too, like I've written short stories or whatever have you. I mean, I've been doing it since I was 13, so um, I've been doing it for uh, nearly 25 years, which is crazy to think, you know, as the time flies. God, yeah. Coming off mic for a minute, Keith. Stop tapping on that, mate. Seriously, that, that'll pick it up, okay? Yeah, right. <laughs> That's a word of warning. I, can cut, I will cut that, right? Yeah. <laughs> This is word of warning. Okay, yeah, pause it. Okay, yes. Now, in relation to your poetry, I said when we first met you, I know you've been, you did rapping, you did a couple of rapping mixtapes as well. I know when I first met you years ago. But we're here today to talk about your debut novel, aren't we? Indeed, thank you. Now, before we come on to that, we have to give a quick bit of reference. You've just bought a poetry book out at about the same time as well, haven't you? Just going yeah, yeah, six months in Wigan. Now, we're not going to touch on that because that's just a very personal book to you, Keith, isn't it, really? So, is there anything you want people to be aware of with that book before we go into your novel? You know, if anyone wants to, if people would like to read it, that'd be appreciated. I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's... um. It's about the it's about a process of basically dealing with uh, you know depression grief heartache um, working through it you know so I mean if it's, it's th I think in that book there's something for everybody in there you know if you're looking for something romantic it's in there if you're looking for something to deal with you know mental health there's something in there if you're looking for recovery based poetry you know I'm talking about like the themes this that and there and like if you're looking for, you know, faith and hope, there's poetry about that in there. I mean, there's there's a wide, you know, it covers the wide spectrum of, of emotions, and it's all about, you know, grief, loss, recovery, depression, heartbreak, the whole nine. And it's only 30-something pages, and I'd like to believe it's a bit of a journey if you read it, you know. I, I, but, yeah, that's, uh, I'm not very good at promoting my own work. That's half the problem, but... <laughs> Um, oh, you get used to it. It comes to practice, man. Honestly, it's right? just you know. The, I just think the work would speak for itself if people gave it a chance. Fair point, mate. Now we're here today, like I said, to talk about your debut novel, which is to come out at the back end of last year, originally. Obviously, time and temperance. Yeah. Now, I've done said forty. I've done you for nine years now, and this book's been dangling around for for a good few years in mm -hmm. one way or another, hasn't it? Mm -hmm. Now. We have to look back to, right back to the beginning of it, and where did the idea of this book come from? Because it covers a lot of genres, your book does. <laughs> um, it was it was meant to be a a, Vic, a Victorian romance, but obviously it was involved with a research project as well, so there was a bit of a steerage on that. But really, um. It, it it just took on a life of itself. Like I mean, like the, the initial, the initial story was meant to be about T Temperance's mom, which is in the Abigail, who's in the novel. If you read it, um, and it was meant to be a romantic scenario with her, and it just didn't work. And then it came to a point where I had to reimagine <clears throat> things, and then Abigail's daughter Temperance, she became. You know, Miss Lee, she became larger than life, and uh, and then it just took on a life of its own because you know, if you have a you have a Victorian woman living in the twenty first century, now we've got we're crossing another genre there, um, and then you got mental health involved in this, and well, with the narrator, um, so there's a lot of stuff that it kind of just I don't know how to explain it, just kind of just kind of was like an avalanche almost like it just kind of 
got going and it kept getting deeper and deeper and deeper. And next thing you know, you have this full <clears throat> length. Uh, I like to call it a neo-Victorian supernatural romance. That's how I define it. Yeah, there's plenty going on in this book, yeah. Straight away with it as well. And it's, if people read it, yeah, it's a book that went off in a number of directions I wasn't expecting as well. Because I remember you first told me about this book years ago. Mm. It took, what, five years for you to do this book, was it? Four or five years? Uh, from, from I would say when you, th when, you, when you incorporate the initial tale and then the pivot... Mm. I would say take about 10 years to do. I mean, yeah. the, the initial story was completely different and then it, then it pivoted. And then now it's, it, it grew into this thing. And so you would, you could actually make an argument that it took 10 years to do, but the once, once Miss Lee came in and everything kind of came into it, um, I would say, yeah, it would be about once she was established, that would be about five years. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's it's so it's the same. You had, I think you had the same problem I had with my debut novels, just my birth as well. Is you're trying to find that the voice of that book, and it's like I mean, because we've both been primarily poets before that, and it well, it took me a long time to get my sec my second book right for poetry, but after that, everything else has gone pretty smooth sailing because I think that said, well, you're six months of Wigan book, and I know we've got you. There's another poetry book on the way as well, mm -hmm. but they were probably more, you're probably more comfortable with them. They were probably easier for you to sort to adapt to in the direction you wanted to go. When it's a novel, this is like a 420 page novel. Yeah. What's that about 200,000 words? Is it? No, it was, uh, I think it was about 100. 100 still, it's, yeah. a, it's, a, it's a full length novel, and it's because it's your first book. It's, I mean, you're trying to find the voice for it, yeah. And I think that's what's happened here, isn't it, really? So it's you started off in one direction, and it came apparent that wasn't what you wanted eventually, was it? So No, I well the thing was I I mean, you've you've read it, so you yeah. know I'm sure you I, I like to play a bit of games with the reader, drop little Easter eggs in. Over well, the, yeah, but I I know a lot about your personal life, so there's plenty of yeah, Easter eggs in that. Yeah, <laughs> I mean but but um with respect to that, I mean, it. <laughs> I'm just saying, like, you know, I'm a big fan of the Twilight Zone. So th there's little subtleties when you watch Rod Serling and how he sets you up for the end. And I've always appreciated authors who did that, too. I mean, you could talk about Laura Purcell. So you put me onto that book, The yeah. Silent Companions. Yeah. She sets you up from the end in the beginning. So Very I, stuff. I, yeah. I love I love stuff she's, like that. Yeah, she's, got a, she's got a book out soon. I'll bet I've last story of another day that. Yeah, yeah, I'm just yeah. saying. I've read, I, I, I've read, I think I've read most of the books now. My last book was really good as well. But we'll come on to that later on. And then Fine. we're talking about the Victorian hmm. literature, which is what I, you know, I'm in, I'm big into that. Um, I always think about, I said Anne Bronte is my favorite, hmm. and she always will be, and Tenant of Wolf Fell Hall. That influenced this immensely. Hmm. But I always, I, I mean, George Eliot Middlemarch, right? She took a, I, I was, I marveled in it because she took a 700, 700 page novel and intertwined like three or four different narratives into one bigger story. So stuff like that, I just was like, that is really cool. I got to try to, I want to do stuff like that. So basically that basically in its own way came out in this novel. Yeah, it's a fascinating one really. Now, I don't think you actually named the narrator in the book, did you? The male narrator? No. Yeah. And... I have to. We have to ask you, mm. and I'm not asking for his name. Do you know who he's called? I do. I know him very well. Yeah, good. That's all I'm going to say. That said, I, I know give, him better than anybody. You know, so I thought you did the one straight away as well. Now we have to go through this book. Well, obviously, a book set in Manchester. It's covering up Audenshaw, which we're which we're both sat in tonight. Couple and also, there's up. also there's a Levin Jim. Levin Jim in it. Well, she. I know you both us know. A, part, a good chunk of the mystique in the book is Mar Marple. Yes. Now, why Marple? It's a great question. Um, I I mean, so I'm a big Henry Miller fan. So if you've read Tropic of Capricorn and Tropic of Cancer, or uh, Proust, um, I think if I got his name right, the, the French author, and there's a lot of auto fiction. So the narrator in the beginning, that's about a, a panic attack episode going to Marple. Mm. And 
you told me before as well that I know you've had I know I mean you love Marple Town if you do from your favourite areas in the Manchester area. Yeah. And do you say you've had a you had a full panic attack up there, didn't you? So oh, is it, yeah. is, you're not quite close yeah, to the one panic attacks, but um yeah. but uh, when it comes to so but with Marple it's just there was a there was a scene in the beginning of the novel and it basically just the event where she comes in that's a recreation of that event in an alternate reality and then you could say was well, it is it escapism for the mental health is it creating another world there's a lot of different threads in there to leave the reader it's to read's interpretation what's going on there i'm not going to tell people what the right answer is yeah but that's where that, that's where heading to spoiler territory now so before we go too heavy into this okay because yeah yeah but i want to ask you a question about the marple thing um it seems just you know it seems like the the perfect i mean it, it, i i like you said i mean i just think the place is breathtaking but it's the ideal place for something like this to transpire because you know mm-hmm. if it happened in the middle of Manchester, or happened in Levenjoom, it wouldn't, I don't think it would, it wouldn't carry as much impact, because it might be an everyday thing, or people might, or it might be too big a thing, if someone saw the character, or whatever, but in, in an isolated, quiet place like that, that's usually, and it's very Victorian over there, so it fits the main yeah, character. Yeah, it hasn't really changed much over there, no. in the last century, yeah. Now, a question I got this when I first read the book, and I've obviously got a bit of a background on this already. But for people that don't know it, it made me feel like it was science fiction in places, mm-hmm. alternative realities and stuff. But then you look at the other side of the coin, and, and I think this was done deliberately, in at least the first part of the book, where you look at the alternative realities, you ask yourself, is it the narrator's mental mental state we're looking at? Or is it an actual science fiction book? Or science fantasy? Because it jumps, it plays around very cleverly as well, with a lot of different realities different genres in this book and you t- you've hinted that already mm-hmm. like when you did this it was going to be a Victorian romance mm-hmm. like what's what made you want to look at all these old different genres and oh uh, I don't think that that was even I think as a byproduct of the trying to thread the different realities together um and like just to go back to the point, you know, is it is it the narrator's mind creating this? Is it a dream? Is it real? Is it we don't know? Is it an exaggeration of real events? You know what I mean? So with that, inherently all the other genres can kind of work themselves in because I mean, the one thing I've always read, the one thing with books I've always had as a guy that likes to read read a lot of different books, you know, it's interesting when someone takes a little bit of everything and throws it in and sees what happens, right? So, like, um, some about the Tenant of Wolf Hell Hall with Anne Bronte, it's not just a romance. It's about domestic abuse. There's also a bit of gothic in it. There's also a bit of um, social commentary. So, I mean, to bring in the different genres, I mean, that, 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 that kind of just evolved. Because it, it it starts as a romance, but then it's like, oh, well, we have a, a Victorian woman who's supernatural. So now, inherently, there's going to be stuff that comes with that. And then, well, if she's supernatural, we got to make it interesting. So she's got to have powers. And then, she can, and then she's going to use the powers because she's the good guy. And then you've got the narrator with mental health issues. So then there's a bit of a personal touch to that. There's an autobiographical aspect to that, which every writer owns. Um, and then you've got... Um, elements of time travel, you've got, you know, that's what I'm saying, there's fantastical elements, because if the, in order for the romance to work, there has to be some sort of fantastical element, so, I think it just kind of is a byproduct of trying to thread those things through, and it just, it just builds into this thing that crosses multiple genres. Yeah, I think it definitely does with that book itself, it does, because it's like, certainly when we got to, the, I've got that, we're going to go into spoilers, okay? I have to be honest now, we're going to further this, because I'm not going to go into the ending in a great de- detail, so we'll leave sure. it. But I do have a question about the ending anyway, right? No problem. So, okay. But we can do, I could ask you that in a bit, without giving spoilers away, right? Of course. But, were you looking at, obviously, that the end of part one, for example, was set in most in modern day, 
And then he ended up with like, he concludes with a sex scene at the end of the part one. Of and this is not a porn book for people wondering. Okay, no, no, no. It it felt a natural progression for that bit. That end of that first part. Was that always the case with that part one? Was it because the book split into three sections? Yeah. Was it always going to be three sections as well? Um. Initially, it was one narrative, but when you so part, but part two is all Victorian. Yeah. Right. So that's the nineteenth century. So innately, if you have the modern day, then you have the Victorian time, and then the modern day, you can kind of cross the periods. And then, you know, um, keep it organized, if you will. But it also, but it, but it feeds the overarching narrative at the same time. So it, it was, it wasn't at first. You know, it was, it was, it was, it was trying to keep this. It wasn't deliberate to make it three sections, but then it just seemed to make the most sense, especially when you have two different narrators too. You have the narrator, and then you have Miss Lee, who's a narrator for a, a, a portion of it. Yeah. Um, telling the same story. And that is something again, you know. We, there's this the dual narrative, epistol, epistolary format. You know, that's something that I'm I'm a big fan of. So, like, I wanted to put my own spin on it. Um, yeah. And then the the question is, was the was the the love scene at the end was that meant to climax the first part? Yeah. The answer in a, in a different way, people might be thinking. <laughs> in a non-suggestive way. Um, <laughs> Yeah, that was well. Yeah, because the first part's meant to be bringing the narrator and Miss Lee together, and then the secrets get revealed, and then the the, the narrator is in love with her from the moment he meets her, so he kill us, you know what I mean? But then she opens up to him, and then that's that's to set the stage for all the you know what's going to come. Yeah, I think it does because what you've done is I think you've done it. A cl- probably the right way to do this book you've set the first the first scene set chapters part set in the scene then you took a step backwards like you're doing about origin stories in the second half which is borderline superhero in some ways she but, is yeah but again it's the right move for this book then you come to the resolution in part three so yeah you've done it around in done the full the progression dead riser i think that's what i'm saying and like, it did catch me out that bit when you went to the origin bit i started seeing massive chunks about a super superhero almost origin of oh whoa she's got supernatural powers you yeah. know i mean it, it would be and again but again with that there's a reason for that because the reason you know so if she's a supernatural woman i, I was like you got to make this interesting i make this uh, who, who would want to read oh she's just she just looks 25 or 30 years old and she's actually 100 and what well, she's born 1855 so She's 162 years old. She looks the way she does. She, it would, you know, it it wouldn't be as it's it's more interesting if she has abilities, right? And then she's used these abilities to help people. But then she's a then she's like this strong character. And the thing about it is, is that if if it's the Victorian era, what's significant about that is that in that period, women were very restricted, you know, in terms of ownership, voting, um what they wore and she complete and, and and she's a victorian woman in every sense of the word in the in her in the way that in like you know her deportment in her in the way she carries herself the way she dresses the way she speaks but then she completely deviates it but the deviation is for her to use her powers to help people and then not be tied to that same person so that's the only way you get it is by making it that kind of a of a narrative and then you have to explain how she got the powers so that's that explains and then it also sets the plot for why she has the problems that she has as well so that's why that's why i took that that route yeah it's when did you realize obviously you're going to set this a novel out originally she wasn't going to have supernatural powers to begin with oh she was oh was it all that right from the beginning was it she would have to yeah it's interesting you won't do it's a victorian romance book originally yeah which I didn't. I wasn't expecting it until I got into. It. Oh fucking hell! I thought she's got supernatural powers. This woman. I thought this is going a direction I wasn't expecting. But there's a reason for that as well. I mean, also it's it's also to put the reader in the position of the narrator, and because the narrator is a Christian, right? So if the so then you have this whole scenario with 
the the question of well, how do we deal with this problem? Because you have a mortal narrator and this woman who's supernatural. How do you deal with that? How do you deal with that situation now? So that's one aspect of it. But also, I you know, um, yeah. I mean, if if it was a Victorian, if it was strictly a Victorian romance, it would just be someone named John and someone named a woman named. Uh, Florence in 1875 in Birmingham and then we just have a romance you know but we wanted to go in a different direction with this to make it a bit more to, to bring in all the other channels you know the the mental health auto fiction um supernatural paranormal there's, a, there's an element of comic book yeah you know, to it yeah you can see like is you've made a lot of notes and you show me a good chunky notes on this and it's it's one of the most multi-genre books i've ever come across and i've read some that are really multi-genre this really is a multi-genre book this one yeah definitely with that one so yeah now obviously we have to look at i don't want to give too much away here as well sure because you've you've what you've done with this book is i loved the conclusion of it i'm not going to give anything away with the conclusion apart from tell people you set the ending in the future and honestly, the build the books have built it really, really well. It has about the relation to to my two characters. They've had the conflict and they've got the resolution, and the sort they've sorted up. The first layer of problems, I suspect, is that's going to build up in the second and and beyond books. What made you want to do this this concluding chapter as a? It's like an epilogue, really, leading yeah. into the future book. And I'm not going to say what characters are in that book and what the conclusion was but what made you want to set it in the future well the funny thing is is that you nailed it it was meant to be an epilogue but what ended up happening was is that it's too big to be an epilogue right it's a, it's a chapter mm. right it's got like three or four thousand words in it so you can't tell it's an epilogue because that epilogue is what it, that one or two thousand words so it's a chapter and that was the whole thing i said well why you know some others that have just read it to give me uh, insights, they said, well, you know, it's, like, it's almost like it's a different book that you're getting into here. But that's just, but the, but the thing is, it's to set the stage for, you know, because if you, if I ended it right before then, well, well, we don't know what happens, right? We just have this scene in, in, in Ardwick, just to, not to give away too much. And you seem like, oh, well, and that, my initial plan was to just leave it at that and write a paragraph saying, oh, this happened. But you're going to be left with so many questions like, well, wait a minute, there's all this, all these moving parts, and we're just, we're just, just going to give us that. I want to give you, I want, so I wanted to write a bit more to create a bit more suspense, and then with the way that it ends, it's to go back to the initial questions raised in the beginning as to, well, what is what, what exactly is going on here? You know, is this something related to the narrator? Is this something related to a situation that relates to Miss Lee? Is this, you know, and the future is to is to show the the result of the resolution and demonstrate what kind of things can arise from it. That's a good way of putting it. That now, obviously, and I'm going to be careful how I phrase this. Mm -hmm. I always ask people what plans they have next to the writing book, and I'll come on to that in a minute. Mm -hmm. At what stage did you realize this wasn't going to be a one-off book? Well, see, the thing is, when I when I was working on this novel, and I'm sure you've had this happen to you, you go off on paths. Tangents is the word. Tangents. I, that's the word I have Even better. To. That's the perfect word. You go off on tangents, and you i don't know i mean so you start writing things that are related to what you originally wrote and then you think well that's actually really interesting i want to get into this a bit more and then the next thing you know you go down a bit of a, a rabbit hole if you will you got like twenty thousand words you have an outline and it's like well this is so then i said to myself i said well why don't we really build this up and i like writing about these characters because i poured so much of myself into it. It's not like, you know, there's certain things you'll write. You just say, all right, I'm glad I'm done with this. I'm never dealing with this again. And there's other things you say, well, I really like writing this. I want to keep writing this. So 
I, I realized that when I mean I realized the, the most notable time I knew that was when um an entire narrative formed for a prequel sequel out of thin air, which is the second book. Just came out that just came in two months. Yeah, that's what obviously I don't want to go too much detail on that. We had to yeah. the first book. What we have to look at the interesting is this first book took years to write, didn't it? Yeah. And I know you've wrote the second book, which mm-hmm. is due out round about this podcast is out, I seem to recall. Was it just after? I forgot what you told me now, don't you? March, yeah. March, or it was. It's out just before that. But, like, it's... Explain to re- our listeners, and this, this is this is an interesting point, this. And this is going to happen the same to me in a different way. Because my first novel took me, as you know, already took me... Pop- well, I thought it took me 12 years, right? It turned out it was 14 years. I found I found the original chapter the other week from 2008, which I didn't realize was that long ago. But the second book will be out next year, 2004, 24th, me. That's come together really quickly because I think. Have you found with the second book then? You found a groove, haven't you? Or the it's the voice how to do it more, haven't you? Yeah. I, well, the thing is, is once you n- number one, I know exactly where I'm going to go with everything. Mm. So that makes life a lot easier. But then, but then when you when you get into writing one of the stories. You already know the main character, so it's easier to write her. Then you know the narrator, obviously. So those two are easy to... Once you have that in, then it's like, oh, well, if I'm going to go into the thing with Miss Lee, um, then it's really just a matter of, you know, you have these different scenes that you imagined, and then essentially it just becomes a lot easier to put it together. Obviously, there's some things that you have to... Put you know they they, they they just come as they, they just come as they come. I don't know how to, any other way to put, to put it. We say oh that would be a good scene for this scenario, um, but I think it's also the process of writing a novel. I think because this novel that I put out it's not the actual first novel that I've attempted to write. I wrote another one that I started two thousand eight but never finished, and I'm going to put that out next year too because I've pretty much wrapped it. But I just need to touch it up. But but the but the writing is different because um, sometimes you can be into writing a certain you know story and then like I said you just want to get it over with as opposed to like if you write if you if you like what you're writing you're stimulated by it so then you know it would be the same thing in your in your case like if, if you had this grand uh, idea that you put into a you know a composition. And then you say, I want to keep going with this. It's easier because you've already gone through the whole process of writing an entire story. Yeah, yeah. I think so as well. Uh, with, the, obviously, the first book yourself, and it's obviously, it same as me again, really, this one, is during the process of writing that first novel, have you found you're a very different writer now to when you first started the first book? 100%. Yeah, I think you do. You've, I think the first novel is always a tricky one for any book, in any genre, same for Alban as well, is because it takes you much longer to, to find your voice and the groove that wants to come to you. The pace. The pace, yeah. yeah. It's an important thing. Pace is that one. When you've got that nailed, I think the second book is always going to take, take quicker. Two months, mind you. That's bad my English. That's some fucking going on the second book, that, mate. Thank you. Yeah, I so said, did you find an on... I don't want to go too much on the second book, because obviously we'll talk about the first book. Did you go for a lot of different drafts on the first novel? Do you look back at it now? The, the time and temperance. Yeah, time and temperance. Yeah, because th- there's, th- you know, there's two or three different ways that it was, oh, it's done now. And then, you, But you know, you I don't know, I'm sure you could relate to this. I'm, I'm sure any anyone has ever hmm. wrote any... It could be a poem, even. It doesn't matter what you write, but you you know when it's done because you can feel it. You're like, oh, that's it. I'm done. I've said what I need to say here. But if, if you're not satisfied, then you'll just be sitting there saying, "Is it really done, or am I? You know, is is there? You know." So with with, I think that's also informs the writing process when you do other things moving forward. Because you could say, well, so like with the second novel, they're just saying, all right, I'm done. That I, that's it. I'm done. You know it's done. 
So with the first one, it may take multiple drafts to do it, um, which is what it did do. But um, yeah, to answer your question, yeah, there were multiple drafts, and, and then finally, I got to a point where I said, when I when I read the whole thing through, I was like, I got nothing more. I'm I'm really happy with this. Well, that's good. Then I think it's just a case of you're finding that groove, isn't it? Really, because you want the book? Do you reckon or I don't could know. you read the book? Do it a public reading. I'm happy to do a, a reading of it, of the prologue as you requested. But uh, in terms of reading the book, I don't. You know, the thing is, I don't know if anybody will just have me sit up there and read a novel. You know, a lot of places are. Uh, some places they do, and and I'm happy to do it. Um, good luck, man. Thank you. Yeah, now, obviously, we have to give kudos to my good wife, don't we? Because she did the cover for you for she this She did day. an amazing cover. Yeah, now, I, I think it's very quick a case worth touching on very quickly, how quickly Amanda nailed that cover for you. Cause... Here's the thing about Amanda, that I will, the, the, on all, all credit to her, I, I told her what I wanted, and sh she literally gave me what I wanted, and she did it very quickly because you know she's very. That's very articulate, that stuff, and she's like, very well. She's very, you know, yeah. I, I mean, she's very imaginative herself, obviously. But she, I, I mean, I was very impressed by how she was able to just nail the details. Yeah, and yeah. and she knew, and and to be able to take basically written guidance, if you will. Oh, this is what I want. And then to create it so perfectly in itself is a talent because she sat back and said, well, this is what I would do if I and if I was here. This is what I would want. This is what I would do. And she yeah. you kind literally of, nailed you, it. You look, I know you fell in love with that character on the front cover, that image she did for you. That was looks exactly like her. Yeah, and I told, I don't know if I told you this, but I showed this cover out to her so I know we're on the independent book press recently, which I'm not going to name. The podcast isn't out yet to that person yeah. <laughs> as of recording. But they turned around and said, with the detail of that cover is going to do you favours straight away. Looks exactly like us. And, yeah. I mean, and, and, and it fits the Victorian theme. Yeah. And, and the, and the um, it fits, and, and, and the style really fits the genre in the book. It's got that, not that it's, not that it's eerie, but it's got that energy about it where it's kind of like, there's a there's a there's a thing going on. It is like an there was an eeriness. I mean, because the, the the book has a bit of eeriness to it, right? Even even if it's romantic, there's a there's a there's a bit of eeriness in the whole yeah, thing, it's right? Somewhat, it's an unsettling book in more in a few ways. Now I agree with you, and Amanda nailed down to teeth for that straight away. So she captured the environment. So she captured the character in the cover, and then captured the the time period it speaks into, and then she captured the environment of the book. Yeah. And she did that in a cover. Incredible. Absolutely So incredible, it, yeah. it is absolutely amazing. Yeah, I agree. I agree with you completely. Good luck, my man. Okay, we'll do the hard sell now. If people want to get found out more about you, where do you recommend they go? I'm putting up a website called kscottbukes.com. I'm on Facebook. Um, what, I'm, not, where, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not very. On, I'm not very. Where are you on Facebook? Then, if you want to find you on Facebook, it's just K Scott Fuchs. K. Scott right? Fuchs so yeah. it's um. Where can people get hold of the book? Oh, okay. So that's that's an easier question to answer because I'm not. I'm very bad at promoting myself. Uh, so that that's on Amazon. It's going to be also available on a wide other range of platforms because um I don't know. I mean, you have like. Smashwords, Barnes and Nobles. You have Waterstones. You have all 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 the main any retailer that you could think of that does books that you could buy online. They have it. But the easiest, you know, but, but the the e file. I mean, the, not the e file. The ebook. You know, it's it's you know, Kindle's like the biggest platform in the world, right? So it's it's on Amazon if you want the ebook. I mean, you can get it on Kindle. If you want the hard copies, I mean. Those are those will be available as well on a lot of any major digital retailer. Perfect. Um, Perfect. Yeah. Well, good luck, mate, with it. Thank you. Right, mate. We'll wrap up part one here. Excellent. See you all in two shakes of the dice. Spoken oh. label. Hi, guys. Andy N. Spoken label. My mate, the amazing K. Scott Fuchs. Straight over to K. He is going to do the 
prologue from Time and Temperance. Over to you, my friend. Thank you very much. We're going to begin now. Papa. My eyes opened to large blue irises staring back at me, which radiated with a gentleness, warmth, and love. They belonged to my eldest daughter, Henrietta. I'm sorry, did I wake you? Just resting my eyes, sweetheart, I smiled at her. I'm surprised Mummy and you didn't have a full-on production about your romance being one of history's greatest couples. Her lips slowly unfurled to a smile. Her fair skin was accented by rosy cheeks, her defined jawline, and soft facial features wrinkled around her dimples. Hedda's blue eyes are like her mother's, and when she smiles, it was as if her mother was smiling back at me. The sight was one to behold. I suppose starting with a book will suffice. She extended her hand forward, slipping a familiar leather-bound book, which was in her hand. Henrietta removed her hair clip, and her long, dark, long dark auburn hair descended upon her orchid print dress. Where did you find this, Hedda? I stumbled upon it in Mother's Things, whilst I was tidying your bedroom. You didn't have to do that, I sat up, but thank you, darling. You seemed knackered. She sat beside me with her hands on her lap. Her excitement palpable through her twinkling eyes and bright smile. I haven't read it, she inched closer to me. I looked down at the cover, the title etched in traditional Victorian gold leaf font. Do either of your sisters know about this? She shrugged her shoulders. So that probably means yes, I had a brief laugh. Honey, this is a special gift to your mother, so it needs to be kept safe and it can't go missing, okay? I placed my hand over hers and she nodded with, more energy. All right then, sweetheart. I smiled at her and tapped her nose playfully, invoking a brief laugh from her. Though you know much of it already, you can have a quick read through it if you'd like. I would prefer if you read it to me instead. I best get the girls then. I placed a leather-bound book down beside me. They're both having a kip, had to grasp my hand. I really want to hear this in your words, Papa. It is a long story, Hen. I got time, she hung on my words with a twinkle in her eye, reminding me of when she was younger, and I read her favorite bedtime stories to her. Anything for you, my beautiful daughter. I stroked her cheek with my free hand. Her smile spilled across her from cheek to cheek. It was bubbly and full of life. I smiled back at her and she curled up against me. Though I think your mother would want me to wait until you're a bit older to read this to you. Mommy isn't here right now, is she? She rested her head on my chest. I kissed her on the dome of her head and looked up toward the white mantle of our fireplace. Next to a framed black and white daguerreotype of my beloved's mother stood a picture of her and I from our wedding day. She looked like an angel in white satin, her long, dark, copper, auburn hair flowing down toward her bosom and back. A flat-brimmed white sun hat with a navy bow and collection of lavender flowers flowing from the side of her headpiece. I was dressed more modestly. A simple white shirt, gray tie, and black suit. Unlike my beloved, whose hair had been exquisitely arranged, I took the luxury of buzzing my hair and beard to a simple scruff. Her smile was as nearly as illuminous as her dress, a cream-colored corseted gown that hugged her bust matched by a long ivory lace overskirt that trailed along the floor. A narrow black brooch wrapped around her neck. Her arms were bare, but neatly tucked under a muslin veil and matching cloak that draped over her. The joy escaped from the photograph. Mine shone in simply having my arm around her waist. Hers and how tight she gripped a bouquet of roses whilst concealing the excitement that hid behind her gentle smile. And just like that, everything flashed in front of me. Tremendous. At what... What a great way then of wrapping up then. Like everything just flashed in front of me. It's like, I think it's a really good prologue to the book that. Thank you. Cause did you think when you wrote that then, it was a case of, you think you're like, you're expl you're like it's like your life is flashing for your eyes, isn't it? And it was, um, I mean, you hit the nail on the head. So I, I don't, I, without giving away the whole situation, you know, the, the prologue can be very suggestive as to what's going on. Well, what might happen, or what might be happening. 
Um, but it was it's to set the stage for. See, the prologue is actually. I don't know if I should say this, but it's in between the last chapter and the second to last chapter. Yeah, and that's we don't need to say anymore. Exactly. It's a it's a good trick sometimes, that because dumping the and I think you've done really well here is and we don't we don't need to give a load away either because what you've done is I did this in my my birth novel where you dumped the reader straight in the middle of it. Yep. And then you backtrack and catch up. Yeah, it's a good it's a good technique. Yeah, sometimes it you know the sometimes it's not good to go linear because linear makes things predictable. Yeah, and that's what you've done there. I think it's excellent stuff by yourself. Thank you again, my friend. I want to thank you today. It's been a pleasure today. I've really enjoyed this. Doing the deep dive on one of my best mate's novels. I know she's a cracking novel. So, cheers again, Kate. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate you taking the time to uh, read the book and to host me and um, just for the entire experience of being able to do this. This is really cool. So, yeah. thank you very much for having me. I greatly appreciate the support. It's a pleasure, mate. So, okay, folks. That's the end of another episode of Spoken Label. Thank you again to Kay. And this is Andy N. Doing as Don Callis says, AEW Wrestling says. And he's, you know what he's saying? He's, he used to in a podcast years ago with Lance Storm, if you remember Lance Storm. I remember right? I Canadian forget. wrestler. One of the best yeah. of all time. He's saying. One of the best technical wrestlers yeah. of all time. And what Don Callis is saying in this podcast you used to do with Lance Storm is stay safe and stay over. And we will see you all next time. Take care, folks. Like Roman Reigns. (laughs) Spoken Label.